Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door was a truly excellent game that, in my opinion, is the gold standard for a game sequel. It expanded on everything that needed fleshing out, it refined everything that was too basic or rough, and overall just polished the entire format and structure of the original game to a brilliant sheen. It's a nearly perfect refinement of everything that came before, and it really shows how far the Mario RPG has come since the humble days of Super Mario RPG. While it wasn't the most commercially successful game ever, it still ended up as the GameCube's 12th highest selling game, noticeably outselling its predecessor on a significantly smaller install base. It even managed to outsell Twilight Princess, although that comparison comes with a massive asterisk. So obviously, when a series is gaining momentum, you've got to capitalize on that and give the people what they want. What I wanted was basically more of the same. Thousand Year Door 2 is still something I think about and want on a near daily basis. It especially took up real estate in my head back in 2005 and 2006. Imagine what worlds they could create, what stories they could tell. Maybe they could even make Luigi's Adventure into its own game, all while expanding on the gameplay that made me fall in love with the series so completely. Man, that would have been amazing, but it seems like Intelligent Systems had a different plan, and with their next game, they would take the series into a very new, very odd dimension. The third game in the beloved Mario RPG series was on its way, but this third game wasn't going to be an RPG at all. It was going to be much more experimental, do things I'd never seen before, and would likely never see again. Of course, before the game came out, I really had no clue that this was the case, and even if I did, I wouldn't have cared. I was fully on the new console hype train, and the excitement is really all that mattered. Just a few months prior to this game's release, I had bought into Nintendo's Revolution and got myself a shiny new Wii. I wasn't actually able to get my Wii in a store, so I had to buy it off of a scalper, my one and thankfully only encounter with one so far. Of course, I played a ton of Wii Sports when I got it, and just a bit of the other Twilight Princess, largely because I had already beaten it on GameCube, but as soon as April 2007 hit, I went to my nearest department store and picked up the game I knew would keep me satisfied for a very long time, Super Paper Mario. And yeah, I adored it. I played it multiple times throughout the subsequent months and loved it more each time. I don't know if this was due to the rush of being a new game in a series that's special to me on a brand new console, or if I was just caught up in the Wii gimmicks, but there was a time that I even considered Super Paper Mario my favorite game in the series. I can tell you right now that isn't the case anymore, but I still have a lot of fond memories for it. That being said, I've never really taken a more critical look at it to see if it really is that good, or if the rose-tinted glasses of nostalgia are clouding my judgment. So let's dive a little deeper, take a look at Super Paper Mario, and see if my 15-year-old opinions are justified, or if there are more blemishes than I wanted to admit. This is probably my favorite opening scene so far for a few reasons. The big one though is that this scene is actually happening in Medias Res, after the start of the game proper. The game's antagonist, Count Black, has abducted Peach and Bowser, and through the prophecies shown in the Dark Prognosticus, forces them to marry, materializing the Chaos Heart. It adds a sense of conflict right away because it seems, like, really bad, and Mario's nowhere to be seen, so we just have to watch it all happen. Rewinding a bit after starting the game itself, we see Mario and Luigi in their home when a random toad shows up and gives them the bad news. Princess Peach has been kidnapped! And since only one person's ever done that, Mario and Luigi decide to go and raid Bowser's castle. Bowser, of course, isn't responsible, and while he is planning on grabbing Peach, he's not gotten that far down on the checklist and is just having a rally meeting with his minions. Bowser and the brothers confront each other, but as they realize they've both been duped, Count Black appears, swiftly dispatches Mario and sucks everyone up into his other dimension, because what's a wedding without a party? Mario is woken up some time later by this colorful butterfly who is named Tippy. Tippy is going to be our main companion this time around, as well as our straight actor, and she's really interesting as well as important, but we'll have to get into that quite a bit later. Tippy takes Mario to a place called Flipside where Merlin is apparently living now. Merlin is going to be Mario's guide throughout the game and he fills us in on what's happening. The Chaos Heart has triggered the end of all worlds. A void has appeared everywhere all at once, 
and as it grows, it gets closer and closer to erasing all that ever was. But hope is not all lost, as Merlin has his own book of prophecies, the Light Prognosticus, and within its pages tells the story of four heroes that collect all eight of the pure hearts and reverse the destruction caused by the Chaos Heart. So with that we have our two goals. First, to form a ragtag team of legendary heroes, and two, find all of the pure hearts to stop Count Black and save all worlds. To help us get started, Merlin happens to have the first pure heart, convenient, and tells us to place it in a heart pillar, which opens up the path to the next pure heart. Of course, you could just decide not to help and get a game over, but we'll be a good boy and try to save the world this time. With all the prep out of the way, Mario heads into chapter one and we get our journey started. Wait. No, chapter 1-1. Okay, before we even enter chapter 1, we get our first taste of Super Paper Mario's structure, and honestly, my feelings are very mixed. The previous games were very organic with their chapter layouts. What I mean by that is each area felt like its own full, fleshed out part of a larger world. Lava Lava Island felt like a real, dense jungle inhabited by people at the forest's edge. Petalburg is just a nice village surrounded by plains and an old castle. Super Paper Mario takes a different approach, very much applying the design philosophy established in the Super Mario Bros. games for its chapters. Each chapter is split up into four sub-chapters. This does a few things for the game, and I feel like it's both a positive and a negative. On the positive side, each part being more isolated allows ideas to be established, expanded on, and discarded very easily in between chapters. But on the other hand, it really harms world building. It's really hard to see each of these worlds as worlds when they're all just separate, tangentially related set pieces that very often have little to do with anything that came before or afterwards. The through lines that connect from the start to the end just aren't strong enough and each of them feel very disconnected. Yes, there are some connections. Chapter 2-1 ends outside the mansion that you then enter for 2-2 and beyond, but if you want to head back into 2-1, you have to go back to Flipside and enter from the starting door again. You can't just head back into the previous chapter. It just has a lack of cohesion as a whole, and this really isn't helped by Flipside either. In a vacuum, I love Flipside. It's a different type of hub town, but it does what it sets out to be really well. It's an area that opens up alongside Mario's abilities. Previous hubs felt more like real places, but honestly, their depth was on full display from the start. You could explore basically everywhere except for the direct entrances to later chapters very early on. All Mario's abilities did was unlock those doors or clear those blockades. Flipside, on the other hand, opens up exponentially as Mario grows, and in a lot of ways, it feels like a Metroidvania stage. There's just so much to explore, and the amount of stuff to find, things to do, and people to meet is frankly staggering. In that sense, Flipside, including its counterpart Flopside, is the hub town that I find the most fun to return to after a chapter and explore around. However, the artificiality of the chapter setup is on full display here. Yes, you have to explore new parts of town to unlock new chapters via heart pillars, but once they're unlocked, they just end up as another door in the exact same place as all the others. There's no real adventure here, and entering new chapters loses some of its luster and excitement this way. Previous Paper Mario games have had these linear level select style areas, but they were conveniences unlocked after the fact to make returning easier, and I feel like that should have been the setup here too. That being said, once you do enter the chapters, they tend to make a really good first impression. Just look at how the first chapter Lineland builds itself as Mario enters through the door. It's really cool and all of the chapters have this sort of intro. And here in Lineland is where we get our first impressions of the gameplay as a whole. As you have seen, Paper Mario is looking a little more flat than we're used to, which is saying something since he's always been a sheet of paper. Super Paper Mario is, for the most part, a 2D platformer. This actually brings me directly to my first major gripe about the game, the platforming controls. I never really complained about the platforming in previous Paper Mario games because while it was only okay, it was so little of a focus that even if it wasn't top tier, it wouldn't have had a huge negative effect on the game as a whole. That's not the case here. If the platforming controls aren't top notch, it'll become really noticeable and really frustrating really fast. And unfortunately, I have to say that I don't really think the controls here are all that great. 
I hesitate to say bad because I've played platformers with far worse controls and feel, but Super Mario is literally in this game's name, so the fact that the controls aren't up to snuff with that series' standards is a big hit. To be more specific here, the two things that immediately bothered me about the platforming are how Mario bounces off of his enemies and his general overall momentum. In other Mario games, Mario will bounce off enemies in a way that continues him on his current path, which makes sense and feels good. But here, the bounces go in any which way, completely halting any momentum or flow you may have had. I know it's to make the game a bit harder, but that doesn't really make it feel any better. The second issue I have is with Mario's overall momentum. Momentum is good, it makes moving feel more like a natural extension of a character in a world rather than just a bunch of things a puppet can do ignoring all physics. But here Mario's controls are just way too loose and slippery, it almost feels like the game's main character is just a big jug that's three quarters full of water. And don't even get me started on Mario's movement with the slow and fast flowers. Complete garbage. Now the slippery physics is something that is going to feel much more natural in a 3D game. That's for a reason, and that brings us to the game's first major gimmick. Super Paper Mario isn't a 2D platformer, at least not exclusively. In 1-1, Mario meets a man named Bestovius, whose job is to bestow a great power onto the legendary hero. Mario can buy this power or barter his way into having Bestovius give it away for free, and with this, Mario is able to flip the world around and experience everything in 3D. At the time, this blew my mind, but when you think about it, it really isn't that much of a stretch to imagine this being explored. Just because the perspective in a Mario game is 2D doesn't mean the world itself is 2D. There's depth there, we just aren't able to see it because of the fixed, flat camera angle. Bestovius allows us to unlock that camera and swap it around 90 degrees so we can see everything that was hidden before. Conceptually, this is amazing and so full of potential. There are so many cool things that could be done here. They can completely alter the level design around this 3D perspective. They can hide loads of secrets in places that seemingly have nothing to uncover. They can design unique enemies that take advantage of this perspective swap and lots more. Thankfully, I can say that Super Paper Mario does do a lot with this idea, but I feel like the potential isn't fully realized and is more cumbersome to explore than is necessary, even ignoring the fact that Mario will lose health by staying in 3D for too long. There's a couple reasons for this, and I feel like one of the big reasons is the fact that the game happened to release on the Wii instead of a later, more capable, less gimmicky system. First, the controls in 3D aren't particularly great, and that is because of this horrible thing. I hate the Wiimote as a controller, especially when the Wiimote is the only thing used to control a game. Listen, the Wiimote has its benefits, it is a great pointing device, and for simple 2D games like Mario's 2D platforming, it's fine. Not great, but fine. The problem is that when you move into any 3D environment, being restricted to 8 directions on this D-pad with this form factor is just not very comfortable or intuitive. I honestly don't know why they didn't just use the nunchuck as well, since it'd basically make everything better. This is especially bewildering because the game was originally designed for GameCube, and Wow, that controller had a nice control stick. So it couldn't be that they just didn't want to use a control stick for the 2D platforming sections. But anyways, because you're attempting to control a 3D platformer with just 8 directions, along with Mario's super loose controls, you don't get nearly as much control over your jumps as you'd want, which makes everything just feel even worse. Add on the fact that both Mario and his enemies are just 2D sprites makes lining jumps up even more unwieldy than they all already are. It's not like it's impossible to do anything, but the whole experience of controlling Mario is much more difficult than it is in either 2D or his 3D games, which is unfortunate. Adding to the difficulty, Mario has a specific location within the 3D world, even when you're viewing things in 2D. So when you flip, you could just end up with no ground beneath you. The game gives you the chance to jump once in these situations, but depending on where you are, you could just end up falling because the game decided you weren't on the ground that you thought you were on. Another thing that kinda harms the 3D part of the game are the visuals. In my previous video, I alluded to the fact that Super Paper Mario is the most creative of the Paper Mario games, 
games, and I 100% stand by that assessment. I absolutely love how the vast majority of this game looks. Each world has a unique style, with some more unique than others, like the Bitlands for instance, but every world is great to look at until you swap into 3D. Yeah, unfortunately, the really good visual design doesn't really translate well into 3D. It doesn't look awful, especially in areas that are more contained, but out in the open, you basically end up with two sides looking designed, left and down, and three, up, right, and ahead, being completely barren and lacking anything. I'm sure this was just a limitation of the Wii, and if the game was made on Switch or something else, the draw distance and just overall population could be improved, but as it is, this is a game that looks great half the time, and less than amazing in the other half. Thankfully, when it comes to character and enemy design, they knocked it out of the park 100%. I absolutely adore the abstract, sectioned, polygonal character design that fills Flipside and the surrounding worlds. It's so simple, so unique, and it ends up being really expressive too. And on top of that, just the small little details, like the computer mouse selecting Mario when he swaps into 3D is so unique and really helps give this game its own feel compared to the rest of the series. On the topic of the presentation, the music is super good, with some of the best individual tracks found in the series here. Tracks like Outer Space, and Over There Stare, do a great job of representing their individual levels, and other tracks like Oh Chunks' theme, and The Ultimate Show, really pump up important boss battles. Heading back towards the gameplay here, Mario has a few other abilities that round out his moveset a bit. First is Tippy herself. She can give Mario information about anything you point at with the Wiimote, as well as using her power to unveil hidden blocks, items, and doors. This is another thing that would have been much better using the nunchuck as well, since you can't point the Wiimote at the screen when you're holding it like this. Another small mechanic that is by no means game breaking, but just a frequent annoyance. And lastly, Mario gets things called pixels, which basically act as replacements for the abilities that partners gave to Mario in previous games, as well as some of Mario's more basic abilities. You've got things like bombs, a platform to carry you over spikes, a long range grab, stuff like that. But pixels also give Mario the ability to do things like use a hammer or ground pound. I do like the pixels overall, especially some of the more unique ones like Dottie, who shrinks Mario down so he can fit into small gaps, or Fleep, who can reveal hidden things from within cracks in space-time. Sure, they are similar to some of Mario's abilities from previous games, but they're different enough that they at least deserve the callout. Of course, they aren't as unique, interesting, or impactful to the story as partners were, but Super Paper Mario does something a little different to lessen their necessity a bit. I mentioned that one of Mario's main goals was to recruit four heroes to prevent the prophecy from coming true. Well, immediately after Chapter 1, Mario finds Peach unconscious and after waking her up, she decides to join Mario's quest. She doesn't have the ability to flip dimensions at all, but her abilities are quite impressive all the same. She can use her parasol to glide through the air after jumping, giving her the longest horizontal distance from a jump, and in combat, she can hide underneath it to block all incoming damage, which does end up being pretty useful in a few specific places. Shortly after that, in Chapter 3, Mario and Peach come across Bowser's new makeshift castle. This is such a great scene because it really shows how 
how far Bowser has come in this particular subseries. After a fight with Mario that he of course loses, Mario asks Bowser to join the quest to save all worlds. Bowser's response is hilarious. He just says, no, I don't wanna. A few times until Peach finally convinces him that if all worlds end, there will be nothing left for him to conquer. Beaten by this Catch-22, Bowser reluctantly joins up and is the party's bruiser. He's slow, is really awful to jump with, but his raw damage is twice that of Mario and Peach's, and he can use his flame breath in combat in order to take out enemies from afar. Now that I've mentioned the combat, I may as well get into it. Obviously, there's no turn-based battling or anything anymore since the game is entirely platforming. That kind of puts this game in a weird spot. It has some leftovers from previous games like HP, experience points, and items, but a lot of it feels a bit out of place. Experience in particular is super weird here. The previous Paper Mario games experience system was really simple and elegant. Mario always needed 100 star points to level up, and as Mario leveled up, he'd need to fight stronger enemies to get him the star points he needed to do it again. Here, they've obviously taken from the original Super Mario Bros again, and instead of any intuitive experience solution, it's just points. Enemies always drop the same amount of points in any given situation, and when Mario gets to an arbitrary number of points, he levels up. Listen, I know this is very similar to how the majority of JRPGs handle experience and is just framed in a really poor way. I also know that since there are a lot of more enemies here, the traditional 100 star points to level up thing wouldn't work. I just wish they at least tried to do something a little more intuitive than just tie something as important as leveling up to what's effectively just a gag at the game's name. Alright, onto the combat itself. It's fine, it really is. Like I said earlier, the slippery movement and the weird perspective of the 3D world make actually hitting regular enemies harder than it should be, and the awkward bouncing off of those enemies gets to be annoying, but I feel like the combat really does shine when it comes to bosses, especially when they go all out and make the bosses super unique or have fun gimmicks. Fractale from Chapter 1 is a lot of fun. He uses everything Mario can do at the time really well, and makes for a really intimidating fight. Of course, he's super easy if you know what you're doing, but I'm not gonna count that against it in any way. He's a lot of fun. Chapter 3's Francis is another great one, making you react to where he appears on screen, all while dodging his attack cats. Obviously, Bowser excels in this situation since doing double damage is always good, but boss patterns and designs are varied enough that it's not always the best choice to pick the big lug. So I've kind of just been ragging on almost everything so far, and I want to be clear here that I'm not just being negative for negativity's sake. I went into this game wanting to be more critical of something that I kind of just accepted as it was when it released, and I certainly am. But it's definitely not all bad. I've already talked about how the lack of cohesion between levels hurt the world building, but on the flip side, it makes each individual level that much more unique. And this was a big reason I was able to push through the less than amazing core gameplay loop with very little resistance. The amount of level variety is absolutely through the roof here. One level you'll be doing pretty standard platformer stuff in a swamp, in another you'll be fighting a boss in a side-scrolling shmup, and another will seem fairly standard until all of a sudden you're in a Dragon Quest parody. This isn't just a few levels either, most of them have interesting gimmicks which keeps the experience fresh from stage to stage. This amount of experimentation and throw everything at the wall to see what sticks style of stage design really saves a lot of this game in my eyes. If every stage was just Lineland 1-1 but with higher difficulty enemies and platforming the entire way through, it would be super boring, but it does a really good job of making sure levels have generally interesting stuff to do. Of course, not every level or even every chapter is amazing. Even ones that I really like have ended up pretty divisive. For example, I really like chapter 2. Right away, I already know that half the people watching this are saying, ah, of course, me too. And the other half is saying, I can't believe how bad a person you are. And yeah, I understand. So it starts off pretty standard. Just a platforming stage designed to be the tutorial for Peach's floating. It's not horrible by any standards, but it's just kind of there. That all changes once we get into Chapter 2-2. We enter a mansion and are met by the resident's maid, Mimi. This part of the chapter is just exploring the section of the mansion we can access, falling into traps and using the flip ability to get around in a pretty fun way. That's pretty cool, but everything just goes crazy in Chapter 2-3. 
Mario sees a vase on top of a block and being a video game character, finds a way to break it. That was apparently Mimi's favorite and we are saddled with the debt in order to pay back the entirety of the cost. This is where things get a little controversial. Mario has to repay this debt by jumping at blocks over and over or running in a hamster wheel to generate energy. He's given some money for that which he can use to pay off the debt. Now, I love this, but I can definitely see why many don't. It's a big joke about how reckless video game protagonists can be and how much stuff they break with no consequences levied against them at all. And being a joke at the player's expense, the punishment for the crime is comically unreasonable. If you're in on the joke, this is hilarious, but if you're not, then you just have to add the game forcing you to literally run in circles for basically no reason to its list of sins, which is obviously incredibly tedious. Once you know what to do, you can find an easy way to pay off the debt really quickly, but if you don't, you need to explore a lot and there's no real obvious tell for when you can progress to the next step. And yeah, I can definitely see a lot of the humor falling flat on people who are just taping a direction on the Wiimote down and walking away, thinking they genuinely need to run for however many hours it would take to get that money normally. The entirety of Chapter 2-4 is basically a boss fight which is great, but I think it's safe to say that 2-3 overshadows most everything else. Now, if that was the only time the game did this sort of thing where it takes up time as a gag, I feel a lot more people would probably be more forgiving, but unfortunately there is another. Chapter 5, Land of the Kragnans is, in my opinion, to this point in the series, the absolute lowest point and it isn't even a competition. This chapter is a prehistoric themed world that has caveman type residents that speak in surfer slang, which seems like it would be really funny on paper, but ends up being super annoying. On top of that, it has pretty boring level design, these elephant enemies that have way too much health for no reason, and these enemies that send you back to flip side if they ever touch you even once. That would be pretty bad on its own, but that's not even the worst part of it. Oh, and have I mentioned that this is all just from chapter 5-1? Yeah, it's gonna get bad. Now, later parts of the chapter have things like useless minecart sections, negative points, or even more interactions with the Kragnons, but the worst part is back in 5-1. As you go through the level, you will come across these three blocks. They don't seem to do anything, but there's nothing else of interest around, so they must be important to progress. You need to head all the way back to town, and when you get there, this guy tells you which order to hit those blocks to progress. That's fine, Nintendo's done the whole hit three things in a specific order a ton. If that was it, I'd have no complaints, but that's not it. Later on in the level, you come across another set of blocks. Obviously, you need to hit them in another order, which you don't know. So, after a long backtrack, you ask the guy for the order again. This time, it's way more tedious. This hoser won't just tell you, oh no, he wants you to spell out the word please on the in-game keypad not once, but twice. To show your gratitude, you know? Once that's done, he will finally give you the order. 25. That's the amount of jumps you need to do in the exact right order to get to the end of the chapter. Imagine seeing this back in 2007, before we had powerful word processors in our pockets at all times. You actually had to go and get a sheet of paper and pen, and write down everything out individually. And if you're dyslexic like me, you can very easily swap things around or write them down wrong, which turns this section into an absolute nightmare. It's not as bad now because you can take screenshots or photos or whatever, but you weren't intended to be able to do that, so I'm not counting it as a plus. It's awful. So yeah, this is easily the worst part of the game, but credit where credit is due, beyond this chapter, everything picks up at an incredible pace, and that has a lot to do with the writing and narrative choices. So obviously the game is very self-aware and tongue-in-cheek, going really hard into breaking the fourth wall for not only humor, but for a bit of world building as well. The humor peaks in chapter three with basically anything involving Francis being amazing. I felt called out by these security questions back in 2007, and I still feel called out by them now. The humor in general is just on point so frequently. From the one-off characters, the environmental jokes, and even the game over gags, Paper Mario has never been funnier in a more obvious sense. 
Now the narrative really starts to get going in Chapter 6. It's never quite as down to earth as the previous games, but that is understandable. There are some meaningful parts in previous chapters, like in Chapter 4, where Mario helps the alien Squirps reach the end of the Woe Zone in order to honor the wishes of his long dead mother, and loads of stuff in between chapters which I'll get into shortly. Chapter 6, however, is where the threat of the Void and its effects on worlds comes into picture. We enter the Samur Kingdom and need to act quickly, as the Void is nearly upon us. We try to fight our way through the Kingdom's 100-man tournament, but before we even make it a quarter of the way, the Void grows and consumes everything. Mario and his crew escape, but when they return, there's nothing left. The whole world has been devoured, and all that remains is a white void. Even the pure heart has been consumed, being nothing but a useless heart-shaped rock. I love this section so much. Not only does it really start to hammer home how serious the void is, and how hopeless the whole situation feels, but it actually subverts our expectations for how the chapter structure is set up. At the start we get told that we need to fight through all 100 Samur guys to get the pure heart, a reward for being the chosen heroes, but when we get to 6-2 everything is destroyed. There is no 6-3 or 6-4 in the main game. After reaching 6-2 again and grabbing the destroyed pure heart, Mario is trapped by Dementio, one of Black's minions, who kills him along with Bowser and Peach. So I should probably talk about the minions for a bit as well. Count Black is the game's main antagonist, and he has four minions that serve under him and act as roadblocks for Mario and his party. Remember Mimi? She's one of Black's minions, a shapeshifter that turns into this monstrosity when in battle. There's also O-Chunks, who's really just a nice guy, if a little on the dull side, that ends up taking orders from Count Black. He can fly by farting. That isn't relevant to anything, but that's how he works. These two aren't super deep and aren't incredibly relevant to the overall plot, but they're fun when they do show up. Thirdly though is Dementio, a master of dimensions that can pop in and out of any world he pleases whenever he wants. He's mysterious and cryptic, and he always seems like he's up to something. He makes mistakes with his dastardly plans, but it always seems like his mistakes aren't exactly full mistakes, you know what I mean? And lastly, Black's fourth minion joins up a little bit after the game starts, the mysterious Mr. L. This is obviously just Luigi, who has been brainwashed by Black's second-in-command, Nastasia, and he pops up a few times to fight with Mario and his giant robot, mainly chapters 4 and 6. Mr. L acts pretty much like the opposite of regular Luigi. He's confident, brash, and always willing to be on the front lines. It's a pretty fun twist on his character, but unfortunately, he's not like that for super long. After being defeated by Mario in the remnants of the Samur Kingdom, Dementio does his thing and kills off Luigi as well. Now, where does a video game character go when they've lost all of their lives? Back to the title screen, of course, but ignore that. In universe, Super Paper Mario answers that question. If you're evil, like Mario, you go straight to hell. Well, I guess something more akin to the Greek underworld, the underwear. If you're good though, like Peach, you get sent to the over there which is basically the Kirby end of level stage bonus, a ton of cloud levels up to the top. The underwear and over there make up chapter 7, and the game subverts expectations again to get us here. We don't enter chapter 7 via the door, at least not at first, since, you know, Dementio blew us up, and the pure heart is just a stone. This is another really fun chapter, lots of great character interactions with the angel Love Bee, as well as her parents, Queen Jadies and Granby. There's also some other fun stuff here, like the aforementioned Dragon Quest parody, and feeding Peach a bunch of poison apples to get some wacky results, and some really annoying platforming. And let's not forget Luigi, who finally joins up as the final hero in this chapter. Once that's all wrapped up, Mario and Co have all of the pure hearts and all that's left to do is beat Black and save all worlds. Before we fight Black though, we should probably try to understand who he is and why he's doing what he does. This is never directly told to Mario and is almost entirely told through flashbacks in between chapters. This is the emotional core of the game and is easily my favorite aspect of it. And this is where we bring Tippy back in. She's been around the whole game, even giving us the third pure heart, but her entire deal 
Who she is, where she came from, has been a complete mystery for the whole game. However, it's through these flashbacks that we get to start to see what's really going on. Lumiere and Timpani were two members of different tribes. Timpani of the Ancients and Blumiere of the Tribe of Darkness. Timpani saved Blumiere's life and upon meeting more, the two fell deeply in love. However, since the two tribes were enemies, they could never truly be happy together where they were. So, the two planned to leave and forge a new life together in a different world. Blumiere's father caught word of this and threatened to split them up, and eventually, he did. We don't know exactly what happened, but Timpani ended up badly wounded, only being saved from death by Merlin, who turned her into a pixel, unfortunately wiping her memory in the process. Upon learning this, Blumiere, consumed by rage, takes the Dark Prognosticus from his tribe, and vows to destroy all worlds. And this is one of the most important things about Count Fleck. He's not just some bad guy out to do a bad because he is the bad. He's got more depth than that. His motivations are truly personal, and everything that is set to be destroyed is largely just collateral damage. He's so set on his personal revenge for what his tribe did to Timpani and himself that he's willing to sacrifice everything to achieve that vengeance. This includes himself too, and he knows it. Sure, he He's told his minions that once all worlds are destroyed, he'd still be around and be able to create a new, perfect world in his own image, but that's all a lie. He knows that the void consuming all means the void consuming all. His grief and anger are so absolute that he's willing to be obliterated with everything else. Over time, he seems to start regretting this decision, but in his mind, the second he created the Void, all worlds were already over, so there's no point in even trying to stop it. He and everyone else should just lay down and accept their fates. But Mario's not gonna let that happen. With all of the pure hearts, the way to Count Black's castle is open, and we've got a bad guy to beat up. Yeah, it feels kind of weird to go straight back to this after all of that, but Mario really isn't involved in this story at all. It's kind of funny. Mario basically ends up being a bit player in someone else's story here. Yes, he's one of the four heroes prophesized to stop the Dark Prognosticus, but the characters that are most important here are Black and Tippy. Everyone else is kind of just along for the ride. But this ride has to come to an end at some point, so the party heads into Black's castle to try to stop him. This is a really cool dungeon for a lot of reasons. One, since it's so monochrome, it's much trickier to navigate. It's really hard to see which places you've gone to and which are new when they're all mostly invisible, you know? And secondly, it's just a really interesting place to look at. I've complained about areas being mainly black and white before, but here, it's just so stark that it circles around to being really cool again. I can definitely see both of these points being negatives for others, but here at the end of the game, having a nice dungeon to get lost in and navigate around is really appreciated compared to the more one and done levels from early on. And the stakes are really high here too. Each part of this chapter ends with one of the party members being lost, seemingly killed. First, Bowser has a strongman competition against O-Chunks, holding up a roof until it finally collapses behind Mario. Peach gets goaded into a one-on-one -on -one fight against Mimi. And finally, after a really cool sequence that takes us through parts of every chapter and is filled with multiple Dementio clones, Dementio reveals parts of Black's plans and how he's been secretly helping Mario and co find the Pure Hearts. After this, he insults Luigi's muscle and thus a fight to the death. Going into the final bout against Black, Mario's alone. Everyone else is gone and everything is riding on his shoulders to defeat Black with the pure hearts and stop the Chaos Heart from destroying everything. The fight begins, but the Chaos Heart is too powerful and Mario can't do anything to him. Fortunately, Bowser, Peach, and Luigi are all fine with everyone but Luigi being able to explain how they survived. With the four heroes back together, the pure hearts activate, remove Black's barrier, and the real fight begins. This is a pretty fun boss fight. Black's moves are interesting and the area is alright too. There really isn't a whole lot to say about it, but it's fun. After he's beaten, all's good, right? Well, not quite. Tippy and Black are finally reunited, but it's not a happy reconciliation as the Chaos Heart is still around, and until Black is killed, it will stay around. So despite Tippy's pleas, Black has resigned to himself dying, 
with the knowledge that as long as Tippy is alive, he'll be happy. And of course, there's more bad news. If you hadn't predicted this, Dementia's been playing the long game in the attempt to get the Chaos Heart. After using the Peer Hearts to defeat Black, the Chaos Heart is ripe for the taking and he definitely plans on using that opportunity. He springs his puppet, Luigi, into action and banishes Black, Tippy, and Nastasia to another dimension in order to finally take control of the Chaos Heart and take over all worlds. Normally, I'd squint my eyes at these sort of last minute villain swaps, but I feel like it's earned here. Luigi has always been sort of supervised by Dementio, even back when he was Mr. L, so it makes sense that he's had this plan in the works for a while. Dementio also did things like eavesdrop on Black's conversations and create his own safe dimension to ride out the end of all worlds, so this shift doesn't really come out of nowhere, especially with Black's weariness to do the whole destroy all worlds thing anymore. So, Dementio forces Luigi to absorb the Chaos Heart because the Dark Prognosticus claims the man in green is its perfect host, which is a particularly interesting little bit of lore considering how melancholy and jealous Luigi has been portrayed in a lot of games prior to this. Dementio then fuses with them and they become this crazy thing. And with all that, hope is lost. Dementio has the Chaos Heart and he's seemingly invincible. The pure heart Hearts are spent and the worlds are ending. Banished to Dementio's dimension, Black has given up, but thanks to the words of Tippy, Ochunks, Mimi, and Nastasia's earlier sacrifice, the love and hope they feel rejuvenates the pure hearts, and with them restored, there is one final way to save all worlds. And here we have the real final fight. It's good, one of the better boss fights in the game, but Outside of the absolute banger of a theme, it's just okay. It doesn't have the same weight as Bowser or the Shadow Queen, despite the objective stakes being far higher. He's just kind of a piece of cake too, especially if you use Bowser and some attack boosting items, he goes down like a chump. With Dementio defeated and Luigi back to normal, the situation is just really back to where we were after beating Black. The worlds are still in peril and the Chaos Heart is still around. But there is one thing that can be done. We end the game where it began, at the altar. But instead of Black forcing two people into a false marriage, they will instead use true love to completely nullify the Chaos Heart. Blumiere and Timpani are finally able to be with each other as they always wanted, and with that, they're gone. With them, the void also recedes and the worlds go back to normal. Our final look into this world is at the end screen, which shows Blumiere and Timpani finally happy in the world they always wanted. And that was Super Paper Mario. Once you finish the game, you can save and go back to Flipside to finish all of the side content if you want. I definitely didn't do all of it because holy crap, there is a ton. There are loads of side quests, optional pixels, hidden areas, not one but two Pits of 100 trials, catch cards to find, and way more. This game arguably has more side content than the main game should permit, but if you're just that into Super Paper Mario, there is more than enough content to keep you coming back for a while. And with that, we're we're pretty much at the end. If I may be frank for a few minutes here, I had a ton of issues writing this script. I never knew what angle to take with it, how critical to be, or how forgiving I should be of its flaws. I found myself frustrated a lot while playing through the game for this video, but despite these issues, at the end I still found myself completely satisfied. And that really is due to how engrossing Black and Tippy's tale is. Their relationship and the conflicts that arose from it are the core of Super Paper Mario, and without it, the game would honestly be kind of mediocre. I feel that, unlike a lot of other games, a lot of this game's problems stem from its original concept. Like, you don't get a game like Super Paper Mario without someone originally saying, Har har, we have Super Mario and Paper Mario. Wouldn't it be funny if we made a Paper Super Mario? The problem with making a fusion like this, at least with the gameplay, is you kind of have to to go halfway with both and not live up to the pedigree of either. And that kind of leaves Super Paper Mario in a weird spot in the series, where it basically ends up being the eccentric middle child between the older kids who are both valedictorians and the younger kids who think part-time meth addict is a real job they can apply for. And honestly, I can appreciate that. I like that they tried something new, did something weird thinking it'd be fun, and told a great story while doing it. Not everything worked, but that's fine. I'd take a flawed, novel, interesting game over a more more familiar, boring game any day of the week, and that's why I recommend Super Paper Mario. It's not a perfect 10 out of 10 game that's polished to a shine, but it's interesting. 
It took risks, and it tried to pull at your heartstrings all the while. While it may not be the best Paper Mario game, it's still an absolute standout in a series that would fall from grace immediately afterwards. Until next time, thank you so much for watching.